Hello, this is lesson 10. We handle the case of complex solutions to the characteristic equation. We're still looking at this homogeneous second order constant coefficient linear differential equation. And what we'll find is if the characteristic equation has complex solutions, then the solution to this differential equation will involve sines and cosines. The goals of this lesson are to write the complex exponential e to the a plus bi as a complex number, alpha plus beta i. Um, this alpha plus beta i can be written in terms of sines and cosines, so we'd like to write this complex exponential in terms of sines and cosines. Um, as long as b is non-zero here, this e to the a plus bi will be a complex number, but not a real number. Once we see uh, how this works, we'll use this idea to find general solutions to a second order homogeneous constant coefficient ordinary differential equation when the characteristic equation has complex roots. Then in the next lesson, we will use this to analyze damped and undamped oscillations in mechanical systems. So let's discuss the complex exponential function. In a calculus sequence, you probably learned that there was a power series representation of e to the x, where x is real. And it turned out to be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and so on. Let's suppose that for consistency, we want this formula to work also for complex numbers. So let's look at e to the i theta. I'll assume that theta is a real number, so that i times theta is purely imaginary. So just plugging i theta into this above formula for each of the x's, we get 1 plus i theta plus i theta quantity squared over 2 factorial, plus i theta quantity cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. So now let's look at the even powers that we have in here. This term, this term, this term, and so forth. Uh, and let's see what's happening here. i theta squared is the same as i squared theta squared. But remember that i squared is minus 1. So this is equal to minus theta squared. Now, let's look at i theta raised to the fourth power. i to the fourth power is i squared times i squared, which is minus 1 times minus 1, which is plus 1. So i theta to the fourth is just theta to the fourth. Similarly, i theta, that quantity to the sixth power, is minus theta to the sixth, and so forth. If we look at this, notice the sign is minus, plus, minus, and so forth. So the signs in front of these powers of theta alternate. Similarly, for odd powers, i theta quantity cubed is what? Well, i cubed is the same as i squared times i, which is the same as minus 1 times i. And so this quantity is minus i theta cubed. Playing the same sort of game, i theta to the fifth power, the quantity i theta to the fifth power equals i times theta to the fifth. The quantity i theta raised to the seventh power is minus i times theta to the seventh, and so on. And so we notice that these signs uh, also alternate um, as we go along. So we can break up this series into the sum of the even terms plus the sum of the odd terms. Um, we know from calculus that we can do such rearrangements under suitable circumstances, and here we can do it. And so e to the i theta is the sum of all the even powers that we have here 
plus the sum of all the odd powers that we have up here. And then these uh, even powers that we have here can be written as 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus theta to the 4th over 4 factorial minus theta to the 6th over 6 factorial and so forth. Over here, uh, we know that i times theta is i times theta. We know that i theta cubed over 3 factorial is minus i theta cubed over 3 factorial and so forth. We have alternating signs here. We also have alternating signs here. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice that the power series inside this left parentheses is just the power series for the cosine of theta, an even function. The power series that we have in this second parentheses, within the second parentheses, is just the sine theta, an odd function. So what we get is e to the i theta equals this stuff, which is cosine theta, plus i times this stuff, which is sine theta. So now let's define the exponential of a complex number. Let's look at e to the a plus i b, where a and b are real numbers. So this exponent can represent a general complex number. By laws of exponents, we'll assume that they still hold, this is equal to e to the a times e to the i b. Now e to the a is just e to the a. And from what we saw earlier, e to the i b is cosine b plus i sine b. So we get that e to the a plus i b is e to the a times cosine b plus i sine b. As an example, let's look at e to the i times pi. Uh, I can think of that as e to the 0 plus i times pi. And by this formula, that's e to the 0 times cosine pi plus i sine pi. Now, cosine of pi is minus 1. Sine of pi is 0. e to the 0 out front is 1. So this stuff equals 1 times minus 1 plus 0, and that's just minus 1. So we get the result that e to the i pi equals minus 1. Uh, this is a very well-known result, and many people consider this remarkable, because in one equation here, we are relating e, the base of natural logarithms, i, an imaginary number, pi, and the number minus 1. It almost seems magical. First, let's look at an example of a differential equation that has a characteristic equation with purely imaginary zeros, purely imaginary solutions. So if we look at this differential equation and you look for solutions as we had before, x equals e to the rt, where r here is a number, could be complex. The characteristic equation for this is going to be r squared plus 9 equals 0. And when we solve this, r is equal to plus or minus 3i. Two purely imaginary solutions to the characteristic equation, and they're complex conjugates of each other. So from those, using Euler's formula, if we let x1 of t equal e to the 3i t, which is e to the 3t i also, that's cosine 3t plus i sine 3t. The other solution, using minus 3i, is x sub 2 of t equals e to the minus 3t times i, which is cosine of minus 3t plus i sine of minus 3t. Now let's remember that cosine is an even function, so cosine of minus 3t equals cosine of 3t. Sine is an odd function, so sine of minus 3t is minus sine of 3t. So i sine of minus 3t is minus i times sine of 3t. 
So we have these two solutions, and they are not necessarily going to be real numbers. But we can get solutions that only involve real numbers by a couple of tricks. We know that by the superposition principle for a linear homogeneous differential equation, the sum of two solutions is also a solution to the differential equation. And the difference of solutions is also a solution to the differential equation. Also, if we multiply or divide by constants, divide solutions by constants, the result is still a solution. So let's look at the sum of x sub 1 plus x sub 2 over 2. So looking up here at x sub 1 and x sub 2, what are we going to get? Cosine 3t plus cosine 3t divided by 2 is cosine 3t. What about the imaginary part? i sine 3t plus a minus i sine 3t is 0. Divided by 2, it's still 0. So this thing is just the real valued function cosine of 3t. Let's call that real solution x sub 1 r, r for real. Similarly, if we subtract x sub 1 and x sub 2 and divide by the constant 2i, let's see what happens. First, let's look at this numerator, x sub 1 minus x sub 2. Cosine 3t minus cosine 3t is 0. i sine 3t minus a minus i sine 3t is 2i sine 3t. Divide that by 2i, and we have sine of 3t. So cosine of 3t and sine of 3t are two real solutions to this differential equation. So by using the superposition principle, the general solution to this ordinary differential equation up here is x of t equals c1 cosine 3t plus another arbitrary constant c2 times sine of 3t. If we were looking at an initial value problem, then we would do additional calculations to figure out what c1 and c2 would be in order to satisfy the initial conditions. Suppose our differential equation, our constant coefficient linear homogeneous differential equation, has two complex solutions to its characteristic equation. In that case, uh, let's suppose that the character characteristic equation has complex solutions r equals a plus bi and r equals a minus bi, each of multiplicity 1. Then we can find two linearly independent complex solutions to that differential equation. The first one, x sub 1 of t, is e to the a plus bi t. And the second one is x sub 2 of t is e to the a minus bi uh, quantity times t. Using laws of exponents on these, those two solutions can be written as e to the at, e to the bit, and the second one, e to the at times e to the minus bti. So now, remembering that we can use Euler's formula on these uh, e to the plus or minus bti, we can write these two solutions, x sub 1, as e to the at cosine bt plus i sine bt, x sub 2 of t is e to the at cosine bt minus i sine bt. Now, these are still complex solutions, but if we add these two solutions together and divide by 2, that simplifies to e to the at cosine bt. If we subtract these two solutions and divide by 2i, we can get another real solution, x sub 2r of t, I'll call it, is e to the at sine of bt. So the general solution to this differential equation, where the characteristic equation has two complex solutions, is x of t equals a constant times e to the at cosine bt plus another arbitrary constant, e to the at sine of bt. As an example, let's solve an initial value problem. 
Let's solve the second derivative of x with respect to t plus 9x equals 0. x of 0 is 2. x prime of 0 is minus 1. Here, we're considering x to be a function of t. Um, this is the same ordinary differential equation we saw before because the characteristic equation is r squared plus 9 equals 0. So r equals plus or minus 3i. So this is a case where we have purely imaginary solutions to the uh, characteristic equation. So we know then that x of t is going to be c1 cosine 3t plus sine c2 sine of 3t. Now x of 0 is what? Plugging the 0 in for the t up here, we get c1 cosine 0 plus c2 sine 0. Now let's remember that the cosine of 0 is 1 and the sine of 0 is 0. So we just get c1 times 1 plus c2 times 0 here. That simplifies to c1. So x of 0 has to equal 2 by this initial condition. So that tells us that c1 has to be 2. Now, let's look at the second initial condition. x prime of 0 equals minus 1. First, we have to find out what x prime of t is by differentiating. Here's x of t up here. Differentiate with respect to t, and remember that we have to use the chain rule. So x prime of t is minus 3c1 sine 3t plus 3c2 cosine of 3t. So x prime of 0 is minus 3c1 sine 0 plus 3c2 cosine 0. Now, remembering that sine of 0 is 0 and cosine of 0 is 1, this simplifies to 3c2. So x prime of 0 equals minus 1, this initial condition up here, becomes 3c2 equals minus 1. So c2 is minus 1 third. Plugging those in for c1 and c2, the solution to the initial value problem is x of t is 2 cosine 3t minus 1 third sine 3t. Let's look at the graph of x of t equals 2 cosine 3t minus 1 third sine 3t. Here's the graph, and it looks pretty regular. It looks periodic. Um, it looks like a cosine function with a certain frequency, a certain amplitude, and a certain horizontal shift. Um, can we algebraically manipulate x of t's formula up here to get these two terms into one cosine term? The answer is yes, and we will see how to do it. What we will see is that a constant times cosine omega t plus another constant b times sine omega t can be written as the square root of a square plus b square times the cosine of omega t minus some phase shift alpha. Notice that this cosine and the sine term both have omega t as the arguments of those trig functions. So let's start with x of t equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t and see how we can get it into this, form, into this form with just one constant times the cosine of something. Let's remember that the cosine of omega t minus alpha is equal by the addition and subtraction formulas for the cosine. It's equal to cosine omega t cosine alpha plus sine omega t sine alpha. So let's start with x of t up here and let's multiply and divide by the square root of a square plus b square. So x of t, which we wrote this way to start off with, we can equivalently write this way. Now, let's notice that a over the square root of a square plus b square has to be a number somewhere between minus one and one. And similarly, b over the square root of a square plus b square is also somewhere between minus one and one inclusive. So let's pick alpha so that this stuff right here is cosine alpha, and this stuff right here is sine alpha. 
We can do that because the sum of this squared plus this squared is 1. If we square this, we have a squared over a, a squared plus b squared. If we square this thing, we get b squared over a squared plus b squared. Add these two together, and you can see pretty clearly that it is equal to 1. Okay, another way that we can define alpha is to use tangent of alpha is b over a and figure out what quadrant alpha is in. So in any case, after we make this substitution uh, with alpha, we can write x of t as the square root of a squared plus b squared times cosine alpha cosine omega t plus sine alpha sine omega t. And then we realize that this stuff in the brackets is just cosine of omega t minus alpha. And so we have x of t is square root of a squared plus b squared cosine omega t minus alpha. Okay, so we just found out we could write x of t this way. Uh, the constant in front of the cosine, the square root of a squared plus b squared, is called the amplitude of this function. And the graph is going to oscillate between plus or minus square root of a squared plus b squared because the cosine oscillates between minus 1 and 1. The alpha that appears here is called the phase shift of this function x of t. Let's use sage math to plot our solution using both forms that we discussed. For the function x of t is cosine 2 cosine 3t minus 1 third sine 3t. So let's consider the example of x of t equals 2 cosine 3t minus 1 third sine 3t. So we're going to start with x of t in this form, which is basically a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. And we want to write it as the square root of a squared plus b squared times cosine of omega t minus alpha. So looking at this, the a is 2 and the b is minus 3. And the omega that appears here in both of these trig functions, the omega is equal to 3. So first of all, the square root of a squared plus b squared is the square root of 2 squared plus minus a third quantity squared. And that turns out to be the square root of 37 ninths, which is 1 third the square root of 37. So we'll take this formula for x of t up here. We'll multiply by 1 third the square root of 37. And we'll also divide by 1 third the square root of 37. And so x of t can be written this way. So now this amount right here is going to be the cosine of alpha. And this factor in the second term is going to be the sine of alpha. So this will determine what alpha is. If we look at this, cosine of alpha is positive. Sine of alpha is negative. So that means that alpha is going to be in the fourth quadrant. Alpha is going to be somewhere between minus pi over 2 and 0. So alpha, then, is going to be inverse tangent of b over a with this uh, a and this b. Simplify that, and you have inverse tangent of minus 1 sixth, which is point, uh, is, which equals approximately minus 0 0.165. Here we have a short program in a in sage math it's written in sage math and i'm running it in a jupyter notebook we're going to plot the two forms of the solution to the initial value problem um, for the function x of t so first we'll declare a b and c to be variables then we'll set a to 2 b to minus one third and c will be the square root of a squared plus b squared so c is going to be the amplitude of our function, the oscillations. Then we will show what a equals, what b equals, and what c equals. 
After that, we'll define a variable alpha, and alpha, the phase shift, will be arctangent of B over A. The arctangent has values between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, and in this case, since we have a negative B and a positive A, B over A is going to be negative, and so the angle, this arctangent of B over A, is going to be in the fourth quadrant, somewhere between minus pi over 2 and 0. Then we will show what alpha equals. Then we will graph two things. First, we'll define omega to be 3, define, define it to be a variable, set it equal to 3, and then we will plot c times the cosine of omega t minus alpha, where t goes from 0 to 10, and the figure size will be 2. It'll be kind of small so that we can see it on this screen. After that, we will plot a times cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, also t going from 0 to 10, and the figure size equals 2, so that the two figure sizes should be just about the same size. So let's go through this and execute this line by line. And so the first thing we'll do is execute this first line. So I'm going to hit Shift Enter. Go down to the second command line. We'll Shift Enter that. Then we'll come down to the third line and we'll see what the values of a, b, and c are. And it looks like we typed them incorrectly. 2 minus the third and c, the square root of a squared plus b squared, turn out to be 1 third the square root of 37. Notice that if we look at this c, we can see what it's approximately equal to. The square root of 36 would be 6, and 1 third times 6 would be 2. So 1 third times the square root of 37 is just slightly larger than 2. So let's go down to this next line and calculate the phase shift alpha as arctangent of b over a. And then we will show what the value of alpha is in numerical form. Alpha dot n parentheses is the numerical form, the decimal form of alpha, an approximation. And I'm not sure how many digits are here, but it looks like it's more than 10 digits, significant digits here. But approximately minus 0 0.165. Then the next thing we'll do is get one of our graphs printed. We'll declare omega and to be a variable, and its value will be 3. And then we will plot c times cosine of omega t minus alpha, alpha being the phase shift, where t goes from 0 to 10. And the size of the figure that we're going to plot is 2. And it seems that we had a mistake here. Uh, didn't declare t. So let's go back here and let's change this variable declaration to t and omega. And let's execute this one again. So we'll come up here, shift enter. And so we get this graph. Okay, I declared t to be a variable here. So my guess is that it remembers it and it will use t as a variable here that's already defined. And so here we're plotting a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, t going from 0 to 10, and the figure size is 2. And we get this graph. Looking at these two graphs, except for the size of the output, it looks like they are identical. In this graph we have the graph going to probably just a little bit more than 2. You can see that 2 is right here, and the graph goes just a little bit above it here, it looks like. Uh, and down here, the same. It looks like the phase shift and the amplitudes of these two graphs are the same. So it looks like, from this demonstration at least, 
that those two ways of writing the solution x of t are equivalent. So we have seen two ways to write the solution to this initial value problem. Second derivative of x with respect to t plus 9x equals 0. x of 0 is 2. x prime of 0 is minus 1. One of the ways that we can write it is, as we saw, x of t equals 2 cosine 3t minus 1 third sine 3t. And if we look at the graph of this, we have it here. It looks like the amplitude is approximately 2, but maybe not quite. Notice that we have a 2 here. We have a minus 1 third here. So this term kind of dominates these two terms. And so the amplitude is apparently perhaps just a little bit more than 2. And over here, we have the equivalent x of t equals 1 third square root of 37 cosine of 3t plus inverse tangent of 1 sixth, minus 1 sixth, sorry. And if we look at this graph, it looks pretty identical to this other graph over here. Uh, keeping in mind that the size of these outputs is slightly different. I'm not sure why SageMath did that, but we can see that it looks like it has about the same phase shift and it has approximately the same amplitude here also. So we have seen that this way of writing it probably gives us a little bit more information that we can use than this one, at least for just viewing how things go quickly, we can see that the amplitude is one third the square root of 37. Uh, the square root of 36 is 6, and one third square root of 36 would be 6 thirds, which would be 2. So we can see that this amplitude is just a little bit larger than 2, but not much. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you have found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. If you're interested in ordinary differential equations, there are additional videos in this series covering most of the topics in an introductory course in ODEs. Have a good day.